Well, this morning, we are continuing on in this series um, from uh, the Sermon on the Mount, talking about this upside-down kingdom and what that is, is uh, what that means for us as well, as those who follow Jesus. In 2009, ESPN aired a story about D'Artagnan Crockett and Leroy Sutton, two high school students uh, from inner city Cleveland. Crockett and Sutton were teammates on the Lincoln West High School's wrestling team. Crockett, who is legally blind, was often filmed carrying Sutton, a double leg amputee on his back. And the show was produced by Lisa Fenn, an ESPN veteran who'd done stories about famous athletes like Michael Jordan and Derek Jeter. In case you don't know, Michael Jordan played for the Chicago Bulls, one of the greatest basketball players ever to step on on the court, won six championships. Never mind. Anyway, that's not part of the story. But, but, Lisa, when she finished the piece about Crockett and Sutton, she couldn't leave their lives. Finn took it upon herself to help the one with no legs being carried by the one who could not see. She raised donations from around the world, coordinated college visits, ensured that the boys were well-fed every day. Thanks to her efforts, Crockett became a bronze medalist in judo at the Paralympic Games in London, Sutton will become the first member of his family to graduate from college. After the media hoopla died down, Leroy Sutton quietly asked her, why did you stay? Why why did you stay? She said, I love you. But Sutton pressed. He said, that's what I thought you'd say. But what? Why did you stick around and do everything you did? This is what Lisa Finn wrote. She said, I grew up on the other side of Cleveland, the white side. My parents scrounged up the money for me for private school to protect me from the public schools and those people. But D'Artagnan and Leroy eased me in graciously. They opened up about their struggles. D'Artagnan, with great eagerness, as I think he waited his entire life for someone to want to know him, to truly see him. Leroy's revelations emerged more reluctantly. He had been emotionally abandoned too many times before, but both began to believe that perhaps I genuinely cared. I stayed because I would not be next on the list of people who walked out and over their trust. I stayed because we only get one life and we don't truly live it until we give it away. I stayed because we can change the world only when we enter into another's world. I stayed because I love you. We don't truly live this life until we figure out how to give it away. See, in the upside-down kingdom, Jesus invites us to live this life in a radical, radically different fashion. We're to have this kingdom heart of love. And the invitation here is to be transformed at a depth so significant that living as he calls us to live, it's no longer difficult. That's not what it is. This is what Dallas Willard writes. He says, what would be hard is to act the way you acted before, before you became permeated with love. Let's pray. And so, God, yes, we want to ask that we are so transformed and impacted by what you are calling us to. God, it's really, it's almost impossible to be like, to be who we were before we encountered your love. God, that that transformation would be to the atomic level of who we are in every way and in every opportunity. We would be radically changed. That's what you're calling for. 
as we get ready to step into this passage, this portion of your teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Jesus is making a call here in chapter 5. He is beckoning those who would follow him to do something extraordinarily different. It was extraordinarily different then, and friends, it's extraordinarily different now. Here's the thing. Jesus is asking, Jesus is calling, he is inviting us uh, to become what I call the extra mile person. There's a, actually, this makes me think, um, I, I know Detroit is famous for a lot of gospel groups, and one of the groups that I know Detroit's famous for is the Winans, um, B.B. and C.C. Winan, the Winan family. I know there's some issues going on with one of the wines, so I get all, you know, somebody told me about that. But they have a song called Extra Mile. I love that song because the, the invitation is to go that extra mile for us. That's what Jesus is calling us to do, to become an extra mile person. Pick it up with me, if you will, in chapter 5, uh, verse 38. You have heard it said, Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take, you, uh, and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. See, in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is making it very, very clear in this upside-down teaching that retaliation, or actually more accurately, as was reflected in this teaching from the Old Testament and from the ancient world, is called reciprocity. Is that, does that word... Ring any bells, that, that phrase reciprocity? Proportional reciprocity. That's not the way of the kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying. Because we read in the Torah, or the Old Testament, the law from Moses, this is what we read there. From Exodus 21, 24 through 27. Eye for eye, this sounds familiar, right? Jesus just said it, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. An owner who hits a male or female slave in the eye and destroys it must let the slave go free to compensate for the eye. And an owner who knocks out the tooth of a male or female slave must let the slave go free to compensate for the tooth. Also, we, we get more of this from the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 24, verses 19 and 20. Anyone who injures their neighbor is to be injured in the same manner. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. See, in the days of the Roman Empire, in which Jesus lived, but also stretching back to the time of the Babylonians, we find examples of what's known as lex talionis. Lex talionis, the law of reciprocity. And that's what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 5, the law of reciprocity. And interestingly enough, in some cases, the practice of this law carried with it class designations. This is really interesting, particularly with regard to the Babylonians. Here is what I found in, in reading about this. Um, there is a book uh, written by uh, Amy Levine, and it's called Sermon on the Mount. This is what she writes. She says, if an avilu, that was a, that was a designation of, that's what you called a person, an avilu. If an avilu, that is a high-born person, someone born in a higher caste, you may be familiar with that word, the caste system where there are these levels of, of kind of like privilege, right? If an avilu should blind the eye of another avilu, so another high-born person, he should blind the eye of that avilu. But if an avilu should blind the eye of a commoner or break the bone of a commoner, he should deliver 60 shekels of silver. 
So, you see, if you were a highborn person and you hurt another highborn person, it was equal. You got reciprocity. But if you were a highborn person and you hurt someone who was below you, eh, give them some money, send them on their way. The Old Testament law that Jesus is quoting, as far as it was concerned, our bodies are a reflection of the Imago Dei, the image of God. Therefore, we are all to be protected equally. Becoming an extra mild person, as far as what Jesus is teaching here, is reflected in how he talked about this law of reciprocity. If you read closely, you'll notice Jesus changes the subject. Did you pick that up? He, he changes the subject in the passage. We move from physical mutilation or the attack to address the issue of public humiliation. Jesus shifts from physical injury, talking about being slapped, to taking off your clothes, being made subject to someone else's demands. Here's what's happening. Jesus is not revoking a standard for justice, but what he's doing, he's calling those of us who are his followers not to make use of it. And instead, we qualify justice with mercy because we do not need to avenge our honor. There's no call for reciprocity. We do not need to balance things out. We do not need to get even. The idea is for us to do whatever it takes to move beyond personal vindication. Here's a pretty good example of what I'm, what I'm talking about when I talk about being personally vindictive. There's a a letter to a neighbor from another neighbor. This is what we read. Dear Frank, we've been neighbors for six tumultuous years. When you barred my tiller, you returned it in pieces. When I was sick, you blasted loud music. And when your dog went to the bathroom all over my lawn, you laughed. I could go on. But I certainly am not one to hold grudges. So I'm writing this letter to tell you that your house is on fire. Cordially, Bob. <laughs> so let, let, let's, let's face it. Let's be honest, right? If we're to become that extra mile person that Jesus is calling us, inviting us to become, that upside down kingdom person, it's really imperative to figure out how to put aside the deeply ingrained idea that if someone hits you, hit them back harder. Friends, we are watching in real time this take place in various regions around our world right now. If someone hits you, hit them back harder. Be indiscriminate about it. They were indiscriminate. So I'm going to be indiscriminate. But Jesus is making it clear that returning violence for violence does not produce long-term change. Oh, it may answer it for the moment. But guess what? It comes right back a little bit later on. Now, let me be careful because I want to be mindful of something. Often Jesus' words here are misunderstood as kingdom citizens are to become passive victims. But it's exactly the opposite. It is exactly the opposite. Look at verses 40 and 41 one more time with me. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, Hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Jesus' hearers, the people sitting around listening to Jesus, they would have immediately, they would have known exactly what he was talking about without mentioning it specifically. 
That's the occupying Roman soldiers in ancient Palestine, in ancient Judea. See, Roman law, which is what they lived under, Roman law permitted the soldiers to demand of the locals whatever they deemed necessary to provide for themselves as representatives of the official government. And they were known, they were notoriously known to abuse that privilege. So let me be clear. Jesus isn't telling his listeners to become doormats. He's not telling you and I that we're supposed to let people take advantage of us and abuse us. Jesus is actually, Walter Wink says, that he's offering us a third way where rather than escalating the violence and rather than losing our personal dignity, we face the perpetrator by making the violence and so the wrongness of the situation, we make it crystal clear what's going on. Again, I love the way that Dallas Willard writes about this. He says, suddenly our attackers or the ones imposing on us, they sense that they are not playing the game that they thought they were, that they are not in control. Who's in control now? We are. Their behavior will, in most cases, undergo a radical change and will be profoundly affected. This is why one who stands with Jesus and his kingdom never need worry about becoming a doormat. That's how we take it back. That's what Jesus is saying. It's upside down living. So becoming that extra mile person is going to demand much from those of us who desire to live in a manner of the upside down kingdom. But, but wait, there's more. Right? There's more. Jesus moves into some really incredibly challenging territory when he explains that being part of the upside-down kingdom will also call us into becoming that perfect person like me. No, just kidding. But that's what, that's what he says. He calls us to become a perfect person. Read it with me. Pick it up in verse 43. You have heard it was said, love your enemy and hate. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Friends, did you know that that little rejoinder there where Jesus talks about hate your enemy, that's not part of Old Testament law. Doesn't appear anywhere. Whereas, when he talks about love your neighbor, oh, God has a lot to say about that. Leviticus, do not uh, seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, Leviticus 19, 18. That second portion about hating enemies, you do not find it in the law. The struggle here is real. Right? Americans are angry. We're an angry people. The country, our country, erupted into the worst civil unrest in decades after the death of George Floyd, anger about police violence, our country's legacy uh, around racism. It, it's all it's all right there, right below the surface. If you, if you scratch, you, you'll get it. At the same time, we were dealing with anger that was provoked by the coronavirus pandemic. There was anger at public officials because they had shut down parts of society or anger because they weren't doing enough to curb the virus. 
anger about being required to wear a mask or anger toward people who refuse to wear a mask, anger at anyone who didn't see things the right way. We're living, in effect, in a big anger incubator, said Raymond Novako, a psychology professor at UC Irvine. According to psychiatrist Joshua Morgenstein, the country at the time, and I would say to a great deal still, is dealing with three disasters superimposed on top of one another. The pandemic, economic fallout, civil unrest. And certainly one way of responding and a common way of responding, anger. Surveys over the past few years suggested that anger had ridden, risen in our country even before all of that stuff happened. A Gallup poll that was conducted in 2018 concluded that Americans' stress, worry, and anger had intensified that year. 22% of Americans had felt that the previous year. That was up from 17% the year before that. So you can just see, right? It's just, just creeping up. This anger. This dealing with people we don't like. The invitation to perfection would seem to be far beyond the reach of all of us. But what if what if in looking at the word translated in this passage for perfect, the word is teleos. What if, what, what if where Jesus is actually inviting us to is not a place or an arrival, but a way of being, right? I read in one commentary on the Gospel of Matthew that that this word that's used here has the connotation of being complete or, or whole. And in its proper context right here in this verse, the idea is one of being wholehearted. And Jesus, when you read Jesus' different teaching throughout the book of Matthew in particular, he engages in all kinds of hyperbole, like in Matthew 7, uh, verses 2 through 4, he talks about the speck of dust and the plank in our eyes or he talks in these kind of these metaphorical imperatives where he, in Matthew chapter 29 uh, uh, Matthew 5 verse 29 he talks about gouging out our eyes rather than to suffer punishment the idea here is to do something more than kind of this immovable unflinching kind of law Consider this. What if the invitation here is actually to one of being a person who practices limitless love, a love that knows no boundaries, becoming a person who doesn't or isn't simply doing good. Rather, you are continually being transformed from the inside out. I came across a really, really incredible insight. It's powerful. What if, what if Jesus isn't necessarily calling us to do what he did, but instead to be as he was, permeated with love? I think it's also important to add one more thought in this vein. I think it makes a great deal of difference to think about this. Robert C. Roberts shared the following. He said, there's something comfortable about reducing Christianity to a list of do's and don'ts. Whether your list comes from mindless fundamentalism or mindless liberalism, you always know where you stand, and this helps to reduce anxiety. Do's and don'ts-ism <laughs> has the advantage that you don't need wisdom. You don't have to think subtly or make hard choices. You don't have to relate personally to a demanding and loving Lord. Friends, that's not what Jesus is calling kingdom people to. It's markedly different. We're, we're not following a, a list of rules. So, let's start with the following. Because Jesus is calling you and I 
to perfection, to love our enemies. Folks, it's non-negotiable and shouldn't be taken for granted. We have to learn how to love ourselves first. That's the challenge. That's a serious challenge. Actually, Amy Levine said this, it's not easy. It's not easy. Because ultimately what all of this means, it means praying for the, not just for the rival team or maybe some obnoxious boss or coworker, but it also means praying for the neo-Nazi and the KKK member. They too are in God's image likeness and no matter how deformed that image may be has become god forbid that we should descend into that deformity by rejoicing in the sufferings of others even those whom we would call our enemy in the uh, early 1990s gang violence erupted in Boyle Heights, that's a section in East Los Angeles. Eight gangs were in conflict in the parish that surrounded the Dolores Mission Catholic Church. Killings and injuries, they happened daily. And there was a group of women who met for prayer, and they read together the story of Jesus walking on the water. A little bit later on in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. Then one of the mothers, she was electrified by the text, and she began to identify the parallels between Jesus' story and her own. The gang warfare in Boyle Heights was the storm on the Sea of Galilee. The people hiding behind locked doors were the disciples huddled in the storm. The crackle of gunfire was the lightning. In both cases, death was imminent. Then Jesus appears. And they'd hope for kind of some magical rescue. Instead, he said, get out of the boat. Walk on water. <laughs> or enter the violence. And that night, 70 women began a peregrinación, a procession from one barrio to another. They brought food, guitars, and love as they ate chips and salsa and drinks, Cokes with gang members. They began to sing the old songs of the um, Jalisco, the Chiapas. The gang members, they were disoriented. They were baffled. The war zones, silent. Each night, the mothers walked by, non-violently, intruding and intervening. They broke the rules of war. The old script of retaliation and escalation, violence, was challenged and changed. It's no accident, but the women christened their nighttime journeys love walks. As the relationship between the women and the gang members grew, the kids told their stories. Anguish over lack of jobs. Anger at police brutality. Rage over the hopelessness of poverty. But together, they developed a tortilla factory, a bakery, a child care center, a job training program, a class on conflict resolution techniques, a school for further learning, a neighborhood group to monitor and report police misbehavior, and more. And it began with the challenges, get out of the boat and walk on water. Let's just be real honest for a minute. This is really hard stuff to do it really is very hard becoming this extra mile person becoming the perfect person it calls for something deeply powerful to be unleashed in all of us of all of those who desire to become citizens of the upside down kingdom it's about a righteousness of heart complete devotion to god to his purposes in the world 
from the time I was a little boy, my mom did a really good job with this, but from the time I was a little boy, I have loved and read and followed the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, in a sermon on loving enemies, he said the following, why should we love our enemies? Well, the first reason is fairly obvious. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate. Adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate. Violence multiplies violence. And toughness multiplies toughness in a descending spiral of destruction. And you know, for as much as I am grateful for Dr. King's life, his legacy, his teaching, his ample, he didn't come up with that idea on his own. That's not original with him. No, it was the one that we're learning went up on the side of a mountain sat down, invited those who were interested in a different way of living to come, to listen, be transformed, be challenged, become part of this upside-down kingdom. Let's pray. God, this is a significant word from you. God, it is not a simple task you call us, you actually invite us to. But God, one thing we know for you, you do not ever call your people to something that you will not empower them to be. And God, not only that, as we live this upside-down kingdom life, God, a watching world sees in real time your word become reality as expressed through our lives. Father, may we indeed be people who in the moment we will figure out how to become extra mile people. Lord, we will be committed to determining what it means to be perfect, even as Jesus instructs us, invites us to be perfect, as you are perfect. Lord, we have friends, neighbors, co-workers, family members, people we pass in the grocery store, at the post office. Lord, these are people who are looking to see if we are indeed living lives that are different. Not because we're so great, but rather because you are so good. Now, God, just continue to be with us as we soak in what you are telling us from your word what you are inviting us into as it relates to being kingdom citizens. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen. <laughs>